So I am thrilled to welcome Colleen and Rita White here to give you uh, a presentation about persistent pain. I think we've all probably had instances of that in our careers. If you're just starting out in your career, we have to really advise you to take this advice to heart because it can really prevent serious injury and problems later on in your career. So I'm gonna get out of the way. If you have questions for them, you can use the Q&A function or type those questions in the chat and we'll get to them as we uh, go through the presentation. So thank you and uh, welcome to Colleen and Rita. Great, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Colleen White, and next month I will be joining the faculty at Lander University in Greenwood, South Carolina, as assistant professor of music. Previously, I taught at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. And my name is Dr. Rita White, and I am a physical therapist in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Thanks for joining us for our topic today, Persistent Pain with Playing. Tips for a lasting career. How many of you have ever experienced pain while playing? I know I have. <laughs> How many of you have played through the pain <laughs> without addressing it before it gets worse? I'm sure many of us have also experienced that. So injuries and pain um, amongst musicians, including clarinets, is well documented. Uh, in multiple studies of professional orchestral musicians, a majority of respondents have said, have reported feeling pain while playing. Um, and discussing and practicing injury prevention st is still kind of going off and ignored. So fortunately, this is beginning to change. Um, and I'm really hopeful with the formation of the ICA um, Health and Wellness Committee that we'll be even having more resources to help us out in the future. Um, whether you're a student, an enthusiast, a clarinet teacher, a professional performer, developing and maintaining healthy habits um, is essential to performing at our best. And as many of us return to those ensemble rehearsals um, and are dealing with you know, changing practice routines, work routines, everyday routines, it's really essential for ourselves and for those of you who are teachers um, to help our students develop those healthy habits. So as we either adjust um, and back into a new playing routine, maybe we're playing more now as rehearsals have been picking up, um, this is an excellent time to establish, reestablish, or incorporate some healthy practice habits. Um, and we hope today to provide you with a few tips um, and stretches that will help you thrive and perform your best. Our objectives for today um, given that we're coming out of the pandemic, is to discuss how to decrease injuries with return to play. I know my playing decreased a lot during the pandemic, and I had to adjust my practice routine. And now that I've had some more rehearsals and performances, um, I've definitely had to remind myself to take it, to pace myself, and to not jump back in, even though I've been so eager to get back to performing, um, to remind myself to take it slow, and to not um, you know, injure myself as we get back into playing and ramping up minutes in the practice room. And we also hope to help with improving some practice habits, um, whether it's helping your students out or yourself. So our goals, we're going to discuss pacing, adapting, taking breaks, and then we'll go through some uh, stretches that you can use during the day, during your practice routine, or even during rehearsals when you've got a break during some rest. So pacing is really important, especially as we jump back in to practicing more and more. We want to build up pr our practice time gradually. So just like running a marathon, Rita is a runner <laughs> and a long distance athlete. We know that if you try to run a marathon without training, that it is going to hurt and probably you'll get injured. Um, so we want to gradually increase our practice time, maybe about 10%, 10 to 20% per week. Um, and in order to do this, it's really important that we break up our practice time throughout the day. So maybe you practice for, say, 15 minutes in the morning, or 15 minutes in the afternoon. <clears throat> Um, and doing all kinds of things just to, you know, kind of break that time up so that we're not reusing those muscles repetitively. Mm -hmm. 
It's also important too that we mix up what we're practicing when so that we're not just jumping back into, say you're planning a recital now that you're really eager to get back and you can have an audience, that we're not just jumping back into the hardest repertoire right away and going at it. We wanna make sure that we include that nice warm up, those etudes, those scales, and then we can break up and maybe practice a chunk of something that's really hard and then go back to something, maybe some slow practice. <clears throat> yeah, and we know with you know anything, whether it's a, a sport, a physical activity, or playing an instrument that it is just so important to allow our body to adapt because any new activity is going to put a lot of stress through our muscles, our tendons, our posture. And so if we can really think about, you know, how can we pace? So strategize. I'd, you know, um, like you to try to put a plan together about, okay, how many minutes are you going to practice this day, this week, and then look at how you can just slowly add to that. Um, sometimes it's not always in your control, but you know, if you have that goal of when that performance is coming up, then kind of count backwards, just like if you're going to sign up for, you know, a marathon training plan, it's, you know, race day and then 16 weeks back, you start ramping up. So do something like that and write it down so that you can really be a little bit more thoughtful. And then, you know, you have that plan and of course it can kind of ebb and flow based on how you're feeling and what the demands of, you know, your practice needs are. And Rita mentioned the word adapting, and I think this is really important as performers and as teachers, that we need to be able to adapt as clarinet players. So practicing might not always mean physically playing the clarinet, um, whether it's due to injury, whether it's due to other circumstances where you don't have a clarinet. Or maybe you've got, I've had students with some chronic illnesses um, and we want to make sure that they are still learning and being able to practice in a sense, but maybe it doesn't mean physically practicing. So some of those things that we can do, especially as we're starting to pace ourselves and prevent physical injuries to ourselves, we can score study, we can listen to recordings, we can research the context of whatever piece that we're playing. We can also do some visualization techniques. So we can see and hear and feel how we want a passage to sound or an etude to sound or an excerpt to sound or a solo. And these are all really great techniques that we can do as we kind of pace ourselves back to playing more and more and more. Um, um, and as our rehearsal and practice schedules vary, it's also really important that we adapt how much time we're spending with the clarinet so that I mean, you know, I've been in those situations where it's like, oh my gosh, I have to play eight hours today, but how can I adapt so that I'm not going to stress myself out and my muscles out to the point where I'm not going to be able to pick up the clarinet tomorrow? So making sure that we take breaks and that we pace ourselves and that we make sure to stretch as we go along. And I think just keep in mind too that everybody is unique and different and the amount of practice time that works for one person, you know, that physical playing might not work for you. And that's the same with any kind of physical activity you do, whether you're an athlete or a performer. And so that's where implementing these other skills can really get you to that next level without putting that physical stress on your body so that you are able to perform when you need to at those concerts. So it's not always about, you know, getting in the same amount of time as the next person in the same way. So really start to think outside the box about how you can implement other strategies to make yourself a better clarinetist, a better performer, and, you know, you can get to that next level without physically stressing your body quite as much. <clears throat> So a really important part of pacing and adapting is taking breaks. So as you are perhaps playing, practicing more, we want to make sure that we take short, frequent breaks. And this goes for any time that we're practicing. I have found that taking breaks has been the best thing for me in my practicing. Um, when I would try to practice straight through for three hours. I would find myself stressed. I would be tired. I would be physically exhausted. But just getting up, walking around, doing some stretches that we're going to show you in a little bit here, 
Um, and, you know, even just standing up, getting a drink of water. These are all things that we can remind ourselves um, to do throughout our practice session. Um, so our goal for most of us is likely to avoid really long breaks necessitated by injury. The worst thing to happen is an injury that's so awful that, you know, you can't play anymore. Um, and so hopefully by taking care of yourself during, while you're practicing, you know, every day, developing these everyday habits will help you from having to, you know, take these long breaks due to injuries. Um, and if you do need to take a long break, you know, to refresh or rejuvenate, just remember to pace yourself and take those short frequent breaks when you return to playing. And as we said before, you know, you'll gradually be able to play a little bit more each week, you know, 10% more, 20% more. Yeah, our body is great at compensating. And so the longer that you stay in one position, we're going to start kicking in other muscles that aren't those ideal postural muscles. And what you'll find, like Colleen said, is that likely your, your plane will probably actually decline if you don't allow these short breaks. And sometimes we're so in it that we think even pausing for 30 seconds might kind of interrupt the flow or, you know, isn't good or something but it's okay and a lot of times what will happen is that you can take even that short break do some of the exercises we'll show you kind of reset and you'll end up getting a lot higher quality practice session out of it because now you'll be breathing well your stress will be lower you'll be maintaining a better posture and hopefully feeling a decrease in symptoms as well so we're going to move the camera so that you can see us a little better and Rita's going to take us through a few um, posture reminders and then through a few stretches so if you'd like to join along feel free to find um, a, a nice chair that will work or you can do these standing up all right so when we're thinking about our bodies to optimize movement, we want to make sure that we have enough mobility as well as enough stability. So that mobility, a lot of times we think about stretching, you know, how mobile are we? And the stability, we want to think about our core engagement, our postural muscles, our strength that we have to hold us and maintain us in that position. So both are going to be very important for you guys as players. So let's talk about seated posture first. So spending a lot of time sitting when you're practicing. We also tend to spend a lot of time sitting these days, just whether we're in school, at work, in front of a computer, on our phones. And so that's gonna bring us all into this forward shoulder posture. Our upper back gets tight. It'll make our head and neck come forward. That's gonna put more stress through our neck, through our jaws. So what we wanna do first is just think about about our posture. So we wanted to um, talk about to the chair that you're sitting in because that can set you up for success. So Colleen has found that finding a chair that has a nice level seated surface and a chair ideally where your feet can touch the floor. So if you are short and you can't find a chair where your feet touch the floor, try getting a step or even a wedge because the first point of posture is to try to get your feet grounded. So we want feet grounded. And then the next step is to try to get your hips all the way to the back of the chair so that you're actually using the support of the backrest. So a lot of times you find that you might want to sit up towards the edge of the chair. That's going to require a lot of core control. That's going to be really hard to maintain while you're playing. And so if you can use the chair back, you're going to be a lot more successful in decreasing pain and tension through your upper back, neck, and arms. So feet grounded hips to the back of the chair. Then I want you to tune into your core muscles and try to find a neutral spine position. So by that I mean we just don't want your back arching, but we don't want you tucked and rounded. So somewhere kind of right in the middle, you should feel like your ribs are stacked over your hips. And once you're in that position, you should find that your shoulders kind of naturally can drop down and back. And then you can think about if there's a string just gently pulling tall through the top of your head, you're lengthening through your neck. So that's kind of your baseline neutral position. 
So once you're here, what I'd want you to do is just try taking a couple good breaths. So I know you guys are all fantastic breathers because you have to be to play as well as you do. So we want to use that diaphragm, right? So that diaphragm is underneath the rib cage. So when that diaphragm expands, right? When you inhale, that diaphragm and that belly and rib cage move out. And then when you exhale, it sinks down and in. And so what I want you to be mindful of is keeping your neck relaxed and not letting your neck help with that breathing. So sometimes when we come, become more stressed, we end up breathing more shallow and then our neck muscles start to overactivate. And so what we want to avoid that as best we can. So get down, breathe with that diaphragm. So I know you're all good with that, but you can check in once you're in that posture and just do a few breaths. And that can be something that, you know, if you are playing for a little while and you just start to feel some tension building, just set down your clarinet, come back to your breath, do a posture scan from your feet all the way up to your head, take three good breaths, and then go ahead and start playing again. All right, so now we'll talk through some mobility. So one place that's gonna be, um, a place that can get really tight is your upper back. And we want our upper back to be nice and mobile. And so if our back is tight, that can actually restrict our diaphragm and decrease how well you're breathing, your breath flow, all of that's so important for being able to play. So one thing that you can do that's really easy is if you are sitting in a chair where the back is kind of like mid-back height, you can just simply cross your arms and do a few back extensions. Just be mindful of your neck. So, you know, if you feel like it's better to kind of support your neck as you come back, you can. But you're not trying to extend your neck. You're trying to extend through your mid-back. So that would be the first exercise you can do. And the great part about that is you can do it right in the chair that you're in. Um, another good one that is easy to do is a little bit of a rotational exercise. So our spine needs to also be able to rotate on itself. So if we're really tight, we kind of lose some of that rotational movement. And so another one that you can do is you just start with your hand down by your opposite hip, and then you reach up and out and across and you get a nice rotation through your back, and so you follow your hand with your eyes, and that way you get your upper back, your neck, and your shoulder all moving together. And so you'd wanna do this on both sides, of course, but just doing like five repetitions on each side can really help loosen up that upper back. If you have more space, you can um, do a pec stretch like in the corner. So our pecs are those muscles in the front of our chest that often get very tight from being rounded and playing. And so if you find a corner, you can kind of get your arms up on either side of the wall and lean forward. So this is gonna stretch out those muscles that are probably tight in the front and loosen up that upper back again. You can also do this like in a doorway. So you prop your hand on the door, and just gently turn away to get a nice stretch through the pec there. Otherwise, you can also like lay down, roll up a towel roll, or if you have a foam roller where you put that vertically along your spine and lay over it, that's a really nice one for opening up your back. If you have a little bit more time, you could do that one, you know, after you practice, before you practice to just kind of reset and get some good mobility there. Um, I've heard, I'm not a clarinetist, as I know you can tell by now, <laughs> that um, wrist pain can be a big issue as well. And of course, you're having to hold that instrument. So um, Colleen was telling me that she found some advice to be so helpful was make sure that you bring the instrument to you. And that way, you know, that you're going to keep your upper back from having to come forward and keep your head and neck from having to come forward. And then you can keep your wrists in a more neutral position. So, of course, it's hard to avoid, you know, the repetitive overuse, but just maintaining that posture can be helpful. And then a couple wrist stretches that you can try are just really gently 
extending the elbow and flexing the wrist down and just giving a little bit of over pressure. So you should feel a stretch through the top of the forearm here. And you just hold for about 30 seconds. And then you can also do that on the other um, side to get the, the wrist flexors here where you can just um, bend the wrist up like this and hold. So just getting some gentle stretches through the wrist can be helpful. So now we're gonna review some stability exercises that you can do. So we touched on this with the posture. So the first one is tuning into your core. So sometimes we don't think about that when we're so preoccupied with playing and everything going on up here. But that core is really your base of support and is gonna make a big difference even all the way up to your jaw. So you can simply practice this with exhaling and gently drawing your belly button in towards your spine and you'll just feel a gentle tension. And so you can just practice that. Exhale, draw that belly button in towards your spine and hold for about five seconds and repeat that five times. Then the next one that you can do is a shoulder blade squeeze. So like we were talking about how important that mobility between you know, the upper back is, we also wanna strengthen the muscles between your shoulder blades because those are gonna control your arms. And so a shoulder blade squeeze, you just gently draw your shoulders together and down. Again, hold for about five seconds and then relax. So you can pair this with the abdominal set. So on an exhale, you would draw the abdominals in and then squeeze those shoulder blades together. With this one, you just wanna be mindful that you're keeping these upper trap muscles nice and relaxed. Let your head and neck relax. Let those upper trap muscles relax. They do enough work. So now we're trying to strengthen the muscles low and deep between the shoulder blades. So we're just trying to strengthen everything around the spine to give you some good support. And then we just think about adding a really gentle chin tuck. So you're just gonna tuck that chin straight back and you'll think about lengthening through the back of your spine. So now we have core, shoulder blades, and a gentle chin tuck. And you should feel nice and supported along your spine. And so you can kind of pair those all together, try practicing holding that for five seconds, doing five times. You could do that during a rest break while you're playing. You could do that when you're at a stoplight in the car. You could do that, you know, when you're sitting at your desk for school or work. Just try to sprinkle those in throughout the day because they're really great exercises for all of us to be doing, whether you're spending the day playing or not. And that'll really help to build up your strength and, um, like I was saying before, decrease that compensation of other muscles that are going to get really tight. Um, so then um, with the shoulder blades, the more you strengthen those two, that can offset some of the tension in your wrists. So everything's connected, as you know. So even having that good stable base of support can make a big difference for your wrist pain. Um, then the last one we want to touch on is jaw pain. So we know that that can be an issue with how much you are playing that instrument and having something in your mouth. And so probably first and foremost for jaw pain is really focusing on, again, posture. And so the more that we're in a forward head position, the more stress there's going to be on the jaw. So if we can bring that chin back, get those shoulders down, that's gonna decrease some of the stress on the jaw. Um, when you are playing, I think just be mindful of trying to decrease the tension that you're holding, making sure you are breathing with your belly to decrease the tension in the muscles through the front of your neck. Um, I know that a lot of the, the jaw issues, you know, you do just have to be mindful of taking breaks and resetting posture and giving your mouth a little bit of that rest. And so your resting position for your jaw, the position that gives your jaw the most amount of space and openness is when you have your tongue resting on the roof of your mouth right behind your top teeth. So if you were to say the letter N, kind of where your tongue falls when you say that, that's your resting position. So we say tongue up and teeth apart, but your lips can be together. 
So if you can find that position, that's your go-to position for your tongue all day long. We want our tongue to learn to rest there. So a lot of times we never even think about where our tongue is <laughs> throughout the day. But if you're having jaw issues, that should be kind of your number one focus of when you're not playing, can you let your jaw just rest and use that position of your tongue to help your jaw to rest. I think this is so important because as clarinetists, we think we talk a lot about tongue position, but we don't talk about it when we're not playing the clarinet. And so thinking about what our tongue is doing when we're not playing, I think is equally as important as when we are playing the clarinet. Yes. And I think talking about injury prevention, that is exactly kind of where we go is that you know, you want to be able to perform well, you want to be able to practice well, and so you also have to rest and recover well. And that's why all these things we're trying to share with you, these tips and tricks for self-management is about really taking care of your body, even in the off time, so that you can perform at your best. And it can start to feel like a full-time job, but it's, you know, just kind of squeezing in these things throughout your day so that they become more and more, um, you know, just normal and your body gets used to that positioning. With all that being said, some gentle massage to the muscles in your jaw can feel really good. Put some moist heat on. You can use your knuckles to kind of right in and just gently pull down and just relax those muscles. So heat, gentle massage, um, you know, on your wrist muscles, if you're getting a lot of soreness, ice can be good. Gentle massage can be good there as well. So just making sure that you are spending time helping your body, you know, during the off times when you're not, when you're not actually practicing. Yeah, these tips have really helped me. Having Rita, uh, having my sister be a physical therapist has helped me so much in my own um, practicing routines um, and performance routines um, in order to be more healthy and to find that balance where I can feel good playing the clarinet and not feel like I, you know, I'm hurting myself. So we hope that these um, tips have maybe helped you out a little bit or maybe you learned one new thing. Some of this may have been review or things that you can try with your students as well. All right, so we see that there's a few questions in the box, so we'll take a minute to read those and then ask away if you have any more. So there is a question. Um, are there any materials that you have that you can share for any of the participants? And then also we have a question about switching to double lip embouchure to help um, with jaw pain um, associated with biting. Yeah, I actually spent a year playing double lipped. <laughs> um, and I don't mechanically what um it actually did help me out because I couldn't bite down. I couldn't create that tension. Um and this was before Rita was ever a physical therapist. <laughs> um, but I believe it helped with the alignment because yeah. you can't go to the clarinet this way playing double lip, you know, we have to bring the clarinet to us in order to play double lip effectively. Right, so it's just gonna be probably more of like a retraining tool so that mm -hmm. you can retrain the muscles through your jaw, through your neck to help decrease that tension and strain that might otherwise come with um, the non-double lip to armature. We do have a PDF of the stretches that we went through. Um, I'm not sure if I can put it in the chat. You should be able to. And then if you can send it to me an email, I'll add it to the session page on the website. Okay. okay. So look for that on the website. And Colleen, I wanted to ask you if you had any um, experience using neck straps or teaching students that use neck straps and if you um, advise those for people who suffer from carpal tunnel or other wrist related pain. Yeah, I have had, you know, like, like Rita was saying, we're all different. And you know, what's going to work for one person might not work for the other person. And so I'm a firm believer in my teaching to let students try, you know, as many things as they can, because we need to listen to our students and listen to what they're telling us about their bodies. Um, and so, you know, giving them the options of maybe it's an elastic neck strap that helps them out just a little bit to relieve that tension. For me personally, that puts a little bit more tension on my neck. And so I don't like that feeling. Um, I've had other students who have used the Koiman 
um, thumb, thumb rests and have found really great success there because it releases that weight from their thumb um, and they've been able to play more relaxed that way. Um, so I think whatever you can do to help your students, you know, try new things, try stretching, try neck straps, try thumb rests, um, I think that's really, really helpful. You know, there's no one, one size fits all or, you know, there's no cure all, but allowing that experimentation and often that bracing is a short term just to kind of retrain the body and help you either rehab or prevent an injury and then kind of strengthen to get you to that next step. So it doesn't always have to be a long term thing either. Yeah, I had some wrist pain, especially during my, my doctorate preparing all the recitals. And I found that actually my thumb rest was too low. And so I adjusted that and it helped tremendously. And for a lot of student instruments, there's just one position for those thumb rests. So being aware that that could actually be part of the problem if they're experiencing that pain because of the way their hands are structured. As she said, everybody's hands are different. And, and you know, just, just a little bit, even a half an inch adjustment for me made all the difference in the world in that pain. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's what's really important with young students too is we forget, you know, that their bodies are still developing um, and <laughs> that, you know, the student model clarinets aren't always the most comfortable clarinets either. And so really being mindful of how much time they're playing the clarinet and what modifications we can make, whether it's even just like, you know, a simple Yamaha thumb rest can oftentimes make a huge difference for, you know, those for those students, like a little rubber, rubber you know, thumb rest or tubing or something like that, um, or just you know, maybe you unscrew it and you put in some new holes, you know, having a repair person put in some new holes and moving their thumb rest up can, can make a big difference for those students. Um, unfortunately, I'm trying to find, I don't see the way to attach a PDF in the chat. If you look at the chat function, there are three dots where it says more. So do you have an option there? If not, that's okay. Um, just send it to me and I'll put it okay. on the website. I'll send it to, to so you. We will yeah. add that resource to the guidebook and to the website as soon as we receive it. Um, I think that's all the time we have. We've got a session starting in about 45 seconds on YouTube. So I want to thank uh, Rita and Colleen so much for this really informative session. As she said, the Health and Wellness Committee um, is going to be doing a lot of more events in the future. So if you're interested in this topic, if there's stuff that you'd like to know, please reach out to, to Megan. Uh, she's the chair and she's going to be organizing a lot more stuff. And we have tons more events scheduled throughout the conference related to these health and wellness topics. So we hope you'll join us and we will be back for a, another live webinar at 1130 a.m. Eastern. Um, and we'll see you then. Thanks again. Bye. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much.